Okay. Welcome, everyone. We're, we're just going to keep filtering in here. And it's beautiful to have this beautiful home that we can all gather in today. In this very majestic setting. To weave our way through the trees to come back to this beautiful home. And Pam and her husband have been so gracious to let us use it today. And it's so spacious, we've got extra seats. So, welcome. There's plenty of room here. Well, it's so great for me to be back in Sydney. I'm just so glad to come here and have this time together. I, I think it will be a very profound time together. And um, I came to Australia for seven consecutive years from, I think it was 19, no, it was not 19, 2005, to five or six, to all the way through 2011, I think was the last time I was here. And we would do tours through Australia, stop in here at Sydney, among other places, up to Noosa, and all along the coast, down to Melbourne, and uh, very, very profound experiences here that I had, and um, so uh, a friend of mine, Kate Greaves, is working on putting a Course in Miracles conference together down in Melbourne for later this year. Oh, Alf, I see. You came all the way over from Perth. <laughs> 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 Albany. Beyond Perth. <laughs> 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 Albany. 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 You just hopped off the plane, I just hopped off the plane. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Oh, it's so great. It's like these are reunions too of sorts. And the beat goes on. But there's going to be that conference down, I think it's going to be October 28th, 29th, and 30th in Melbourne. So, and um, I'll be speaking on Sunday, and Gary Renard will be speaking on Saturday. And then Friday will be a big gathering get-together for people to meet and maybe from all over Australia, I think, um, just to come together in, in this mighty purpose that we have. So we're very grateful and um, we've really enjoyed our time here too. We've had some wonderful discussions about Vedanta and oneness <laughs> last night uh, and then this morning we just have eased into the day. And this is just a time for us all to come together and go much, much deeper into the experience of this beautiful presence that we are, that we were created as love. And we've had some veils and some dark thoughts and beliefs that have covered over our identity, but we are waking up. And it's like a wave of love coming across us. We're starting to really see who we are, and, and we see that the, the illusions of the ego cannot hide our true identity from us. And it's also a time of, you might say, dismantling and disorientation as we loosen from the familiarity of the world, that we're all kind of like swimming uh, through consciousness and, and coming into new awarenesses, and, and there's always a a bit of disorientation when it happens, but as I've been calling them, the Course in Miracles calls them the mighty companions appear. Down here in Australia, I call them the mighty mates. We are mighty mates for each other as we're waking up, and we're kind of arm in arm, side by side, so that when we have our wobbles, we don't fall down. <laughs> we, keep, we keep marching toward the light, keep going inward. And that's important, because I think, um, a friend of mine who lives down um, in Melbourne, he told me that he listened to uh, a gathering that I just did in Frankston, and that for him, he's heard so many different American teachers of the Course, but he just heard all these Aussie accents for like two hours and twenty minutes, and he said his heart was just lit up, because he felt like, oh my gosh, there are people around me that are going through these same struggles and same awakening experiences and it really warmed his heart to hear that. He said, I, I can't tell you David, I just met him briefly before I came up here, he said, but I cannot tell you how important that is to me because it gives me confidence 
that I can handle this, I can make it through, because it's been so intense. He's been pretty much on his own, he hasn't been going to course groups or meetup groups or anything like that, so for him just hearing the, the Aussie accents was just a profound experience for him. And I think that's what we're talking about, that's a reminder that, that we need symbols of help along the way. Because if we feel like we're in this all alone, individually, then it gets to be overwhelming and very, very difficult. So, for me, I feel the Course is, is a very direct path to God, and I do feel that the more you get into the teachings, the simpler it becomes. It's, it's when you have a foot in both worlds, and you still believe in the the lack, and the scarcity, and the reciprocity, and trying to get things from the world, or get things from people, that that's when the Course seems difficult. When you're working with the Course, it seems like it's the undoing of everything you believe. Absolutely everything in your mind. And that can be overwhelming, but, but I feel like as soon as you give yourself over, and you have that kind of yes to spirit in your heart, then you kind of crossed over the hump, and you're going to be, it's going to be downhill from there. Uh, it's almost like being told you have to empty your mind of everything you think you think and you think you know. You have to come to live in the I don't know mind, in terms of this world every day. So you wake up in the morning and you just say, here I am, Spirit, guide me, direct me, I have no clue of what anything means, and yet I know you are with me, and you're going to be guiding me. And I know I'm going to go through the day, make it through the day. And things may fall apart, things may fall away, things may get turned upside down, that were already upside down, they're actually getting turned right side up. <laughs> but the ego doesn't believe that. <laughs> it thinks that everything's getting tossed around like a tossed salad. But actually, it's like our mind is coming around right. Like that old Quaker song, you know, is a gift to be simple, is a gift to be free, and in the end we do, we, we turn, we turn, and we come round right. We come into our right mind, we come into sanity, we come into happiness, we come into joy. All of the programming that has taught us that we have to, first rule is survive, uh, a lot of us have gone through that route and we have survived. You know, we can say that physically we seem to have survived, but emotionally and spiritually, it can feel like that we were like Zen beginner's mind, or that we're just in the very baby, infantile stages of a very profound awakening. And it's very humbling too, when you still think you know something, and then you go through the day and you go, at the end of the day, well, I thought I knew that, and that's not even true. I, I know a lot of us have had those experiences, like, that's not even true. My gosh, how can I even believe that there's a solid ground under my feet with all that I've been shown today? Because it's such a big turnaround for us. It's huge. So, these gatherings and these joinings we have, I think, are, are time savers. We're here to invite the Spirit to come, call upon the Spirit to clarify things for us, to illuminate our minds to strengthen our trust that there is a Spirit guiding us, and that we don't have to try to figure out the world. We don't have to figure out the steps, or how this is going to go. We can actually keep following, and listening, and following, and, and we will come into a stabilized, peaceful state of mind. A joyful state of mind, where we may be clueless about the world, but we're joyful. And if it's really, that's what it all comes down to, wouldn't you rather trade trying to understand the world for joy, for the simple joys of, of a state of mind that is, that is freely given, freely experienced. So, I'm here to join with you and uh, I'm open to all kinds of topics, or questions, or curiosities, uh, about how do you seem to still live in the world. It's one thing to have these real high ideals, and, and all of us can resonate with the idea of oneness. 
you know, that we're all completely connected, whether we come through religion, or through spirituality, or through quantum physics, or consciousness studies, it doesn't really matter, but we know there's something that's there that, that connects us all, and we're on to it. We're, we're getting closer and closer to it in our awareness. And we also know that there seem to be these blocks, and these resistances, and I think the most we can do is we join together and share our miracles, and share our, our helpful advances in the spiritual journey, is it builds our confidence that we can actually make it through. We can make it through the keyhole and back into that oneness. And that, that, we need that confidence. We need that confidence to go on in this journey. So, yeah, I just want to open it up for any types of topics, questions, anything that comes to your mind. And I'm happy to join with you and, and join in coming to a clarity on whatever is going on in consciousness. So we can come to that smooth sailing, easy going, free flowing state of mind that's our natural inheritance. If I can open up. Yes, um, please. One of the things I've been reading in the ACIM is uh, special relationships and holy relationships. If I see the world around, most of us in a special relationship, when we get married, there's a special relationship, husband and wife, then there's a special relationship with children, then there's a special relationship with your boss at work. You, we see that as a special relationship, and then this comes holy relationship. I'm still not 100% clear how to go from one to another, there's always a bit of a I guess, a fuzziness around those two. We want to go to holy relationship and then, because we have been with a person for such a long time in history, the special jumps in, in that holy. So you kind of flip-flop between the two. <laughs> and I'm kind of, I, have, I just would like a bit more clarity around that relationship. Because I think at the end of the world, it is all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Even here also, you know, having all, all these wonderful human beings in my house, his whole relationships, you know. Yeah. Uh, but since I'm meeting most of them for the first time, you know, it's a good holy gathering. But then I also have my wife, my brother-in-law, who I have been <coughs> the last 30 odd years. It's a special relationship. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you can enlighten me with more about those. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that, because those are terms that the Course in Miracles uses and we want to try to simplify it, keep it as simple as possible, because complexity is of the ego. So, we could say that, I mean, I've had people say to me who worked with the Course for quite a few years, they said, they said that's it, I'm through a special relationship, I'm going cold turkey yeah. on uh, special relationships. And it's, it's almost like a fish swimming in the ocean saying, I'm going cold turkey on water. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's that silly uh, to say I'm going cold turkey on special relationships because the context, the very fabric of what everything of the whole cosmos is built about, the, the building block of the cosmos, which is projected from the ego, all the fragmentation and separation, the building block is that guilt and that specialness. So, it's a much better question to ask, uh, and Jesus does tell us that we can safely ask this question. He gives us a question that we can safely ask with anything at all in this world. What is it for? So, you can say, hmm, I have a relationship with my wife, I have a relationship with my son, with my brother-in-law, with my family, uh, with my dog, Happy. Uh, I have, there's a relationship. You feed happy, you let happy in and out, and you know, there's definitely a relationship going on there. And then the question, the helpful question is, what is it for? So, let's be a little more explicit about that, what is it for? Because A Course in Miracles is teaching us that our mind has fallen asleep, we forgot heaven and nirvana, and we're sleeping and dreaming of fragmentation now. That's what the whole cosmos is. And so we need healing of our mind, we need the healing of our consciousness. So, if you took a look at happy, and instead of just seeing all the past ideas of happy, of, 
food and in and out and barking and all the things that make up happy, that experience. And you said, um, what is this relationship for? And then you look at how does this relationship help the healing of my mind? How practically does this relationship help me forgive or unify or heal? Then that's a very good question. In fact, that's a question that we could ask with our jobs, with our relationships, even a gathering like this, you know, what's the purpose? Yeah. Um, how does this help me with the healing of my mind? And it's maybe with this gathering, I, well, it's almost like a quantum gathering where our mind is just projected it out like a house with all these bodies. But, but this can be a very strong symbol of waking up, of healing my mind, because we've come together with that purpose in mind, to clarify, to bless, to heal. And that's very, very important. In fact, that purpose belongs out in front. Otherwise, we just keep looking back at our history of our life and going, what was I thinking? What was I thinking doing this and doing that? Of all the possibilities, what was I thinking? You know, there's, there's really not a lot of hope in, in turning our gaze around to the past. We have to have new questions. We have to have questions that feel, uplift us. That literally, we feel a swirl. At going to a lecture to hear the Swami speak and you're excited to go mm -hmm. and you're anticipating what he's going to say and you're feeling like you will be blessed by going to that lecture yep. with the Swami. We want to learn to transfer that to all of our relationships. So to put it very directly that whether you call it spirit or whether you call it God or whether you call it source or whatever word that you're comfortable with, the Creator, you know, it could be anything, that the essence of that source, that Creator, is giving. That basically God is giving. A synonym for God would be giving. And God gives eternally. There's no uh, waiting on anything. There's no waiting to see if something's going to come back. There's no Okay, I'm offering you love, now what are you going to do for me? You know, which we're accustomed to in this world. Or what have you done for me lately? Like you haven't called me, I haven't heard from you, I haven't been around. And now, what, what do you want from me now? Um, so there's a motive that you might say has poisoned our mind, that has put our mind to sleep. And that, that poison that has had us forget eternity, forget that eternal state of love and giving, is getting. We're, we're consumers now. You know, we've turned into consumers. Not only consumers of products, consumers of food, of air, of clothing, houses, consumers of products. And with the, the, the television, it's like an explosion of commercialism. You know, clearly we are living in an age of commercialism. And, and yet, if we went to ancient times, um, even with the cavemen, it was important for them to catch an animal and crush its skull and, and roast it, maybe, to have something to eat, or to, to gather some fruits and some nuts to get something to survive. That once we get into the getting motive, which has nothing really to do with spirit or source. Spirit doesn't even know what getting is. Spirit is just pure giving. Pure, like a song of, like a love song that goes on forever and ever and ever, and there's no getting in it. That that getting has poisoned us. And most of us can relate to that, where we, we sometimes we do ask ourselves the question, do I have the possessions, or do the possessions have me? Am I working to support the possessions? Am I working to support the house, the car, the things, the stuff? Going around doing maybe meaningless, senseless things to get more stuff, or to maintain and support the stuff, and wondering, is this really what life is about? Did, am I gone on the wrong turn somewhere? <laughs> because I don't know if the creator of, of love is really intended this for me. Maybe I'm off on a different tangent, and I'm kind of slip-sliding away, like the Paul Simon Garfunkel song, you know, and, and I'm trying to convince myself that 
maybe I've got more than the next person, so I don't have it so bad off, but there's still this getting mechanism. So the spirit will, it does not want to take away the little that the mind seems to be clinging to. It's more that the spirit wants to show us miracles so that we can feel so filled up, so whole, so complete, that we can come into an appreciation for everyone and everything without exception. And when we come into that sense of gratitude, we're back into that giving. Uh, even, hey Frank, <laughs> hey, about your son, all right, all the way from Kangaroo Valley. <laughs> That's, that's great. So, we want to turn it around from this getting mechanism and come back to the pure sense of giving. In, even in this world, those that, that have dedicated their life to a life of, of service and giving, whether it's charity work, or it's social services, or it's um, just being a happy, friendly, human being that wants to help their neighbor out, you know, can I help you, can I, you know, at the grocery store, can I carry that bag for you, can I help you do this, can I paint something for you, we know that even in this world, when there's the flickers of, of wanting to give and extend and be helpful, we feel better than, we're, than when we're expect, expecting something to come to us, and we're trying to get something, we're trying to get ahead, we're trying to get something just purely for our personality self, that doesn't really rest or uh, touch anybody else. Which is a, an illusion, because, because we're all connected, so everything that we try to take away, we're imprisoning our mind, and every time we're in a giving mode, then we actually are feeling more like our true selves, our true spiritual selves. I was recently reading lesson number 133 from the workbook of A Course in Miracles, and the lesson is, I will not value the valueless. And in that lesson, Jesus says, sometimes it's helpful to bring the student back to the practical, from high, lofty ideas. He said, today we will not speak of lofty ideals, and we will come down to the practical. That's how Jesus heads, he leads into Lesson 133 by saying, I'm going to be very practical with you today. <coughs> and he's going to be so practical because he's going to tell us the, the, how to tell the difference between the valuable and the valueless. And it's just like a key idea, that if you can tell in your mind the difference between the valuable and the valueless, you will embrace the valuable and you will release the valueless. Imagine the spirit coming to you and saying, I'm going to make it real simple for you, not complicated at all. And so his first criteria for what is valuable is he says, if it does not last forever, it has no value whatsoever. That's his first criteria. So you can see from the first criteria that if you want to know peace of mind, if you want to know eternal joy and eternal happiness, you will have to turn your mind into the direction of eternity. Because eternity means forever. Everything, even our love songs, I'll love you forever, as long as the stars shine in the heavens, I will love you. These are burning guesses. They're, they're going to burn out. That's not a really good proposition. Uh, it, it sounds kind of romantic, but it's there's nothing in the cosmos that lasts forever. We know that. Yeah. You know, it's been expanding and they're predicting at some point it will reach a point of equilibrium, then it will start contracting and instead of a big bang we'll have a big implosion. You know, it, not that any of us plan to stay around for that. We would rather wake up to eternity and, and let the whole Maya disappear, you know, which is really what we're looking at. So, and then the second thing that Jesus mentions in that Lesson 133 is, is, if you take something away from someone, you will have nothing left. So, he's basically saying that this taking motive, to take or to get, is the poison. And you will never know who you are 
like the Greeks said, know thyself. You will never know who you really are as long as you're in a taking mentality, as long as you think, what can I take away from this situation? What can I take away from this relationship? You know, that part in the mind that's kind of calculating a bit. Okay, what's it going to get me? And oftentimes people do leave jobs, situations, relationships when they think, hmm, I don't think it's worth what it's going to cost me. I need to get more than I'm giving, otherwise the balance is not good and I, need, I can go somewhere else where the getting is good. You know, this is how the ego works. So the definition of specialness is any relationship, any thought in the mind where the primary motive is to get, to get, to take, to collect, to accumulate. Those are all forms of possess. To possess is to get. And miracles are washing those away from our mind so that Imagine how your life would be if you simply showed up in every scenario of the dream, in every situation, and your only purpose was to give. You had no other purpose but to show up and to give. You would then find that you would have a blessing, you would receive a blessing with everything, because the motive has been changed to giving. And when I say giving, I do not mean giving in order to get, because that would be the same kind of reciprocity. You know, it would still have the same hook on the end of it. I'll give this to you, but you promise to give that to me. That's still a bargain. And God is not a God of bargains. God is just a God of pure giving. So to me that's been the most helpful thing as I've move through this experience with planet Earth is, has been I have a very strong motive to give. I remember that part in the Bible where Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. And I took that as an example, as a way shower of this is the way to come back to eternal life. Also, think about it, if your motive is just to give, you can never be upset because if your motive is purely giving, you will never have expectations. You are extending the giving from your heart, and nothing in this world can block you from giving the love and the light that you are. Nothing can stop you from being a living demonstration of that love and light. Somebody can say whatever they want to say, they can do whatever they want to do. You could you could literally be put into a prison in this world, like Gandhi was, like Mandela was, but that still wouldn't block you from your radiating your light. I was telling somebody recently, when I was here in Australia, that, that you know, when Gandhi, Gandhi spent, I think, over a third of his years of life on this planet in prison, and when they would take him away to prison, you know, he would exchange vegetarian recipes, he was doing a lot of his journaling and writing. You know, he, he thought, well, this is great, that my needs are cared for, I can write. <laughs> now I work on my vegetarian recipes. You know, it's like, he actually saw it as a plus, like, oh, this is a golden opportunity, I'm not going to waste it. And Mandela didn't waste it either, you know, he basically, decided, I was just in a tour of South Africa recently, and I saw the, the, the little ashram that Gandhi had started there in South Africa, when I was down near Moorfield, and, and also Mandela, I met many people who knew Nelson Mandela, and met him and talked with him, and basically he used his time in prison to forgive, and basically tell himself, listen, when they open those jail doors and let me out, I've got to leave the hate back in the prison. Prison will have done me no good if I walk through those doors carrying any hate or animosity. And when, when Nelson Mandela left, he was, he was a great agent for healing and love and light when he walked through those doors. Because he made a decision in his mind that the hate stops here. He got together with the clerk, he, he met with everybody, no more enemies. 
We're not going to go at this with the view we have opponents and enemies. Because this hatred is still going to be bred in that idea of an enemy. So, really that's what we're here for. And we practice every day with that, with the circumstances in our life. And it just lifts us higher and higher. It's really about us changing our perception of our brother and sister and saying, what I know of them, of their body and of the history, is not who they really are. That I have to be willing to let go and see them anew with a new purpose. And we can do that. We are doing that. You can feel it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Just on those lines about releasing your history, okay, well, how do you actually communicate with people if you go out and you meet new people? Because it's just such a common thing to ask, you know, where you grew up, where, where you went to school. What sort of, what happens to communication in those institutions? Well, as Jesus says in the workbook of the Course, you smile more frequently, and that's definitely nonverbal communication. It's, you know, it's like this, when you're smiling, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. That's very metaphysically correct, because really the whole world is a reflection of your mind. And when you're smiling, when you've got that inner smile, uh, then the whole world smiles at you. And you know that even if you go to the grocery store, or the laundry, or to the park, if you're having a real good, happy day, you start to see the smiles. You notice you're smiling and you notice there's a lot of smiles around you. Also, Jesus says, your forehead is serene. Interesting. Your forehead is serene. In other words, you're, you don't have a furrow, like a frown, or the stressful lines going through your forehead of, of what am I going to do, how am I going to get this done, how, you know, almost like you're, you've got a list in your mind of all the, your to-do list. And somehow you've convinced yourself in a crazy way that you better get a lot of checks on the to-do list or it's not going to be a happy day. Somehow it's a crazy thing that you have, you've forgotten that you're a human being and now you've become a human doing and you better get the list done or it turns to a frown and your forehead isn't serene. Also, I like that when Jesus says miracles are involunt involuntary, they should not be under conscious control. The thing was, when I first started studying the Course, and I read it for eight hours a day in the first two and a half years, that I, I went to a Course conference and, and um, I was introduced to um, John Mundy and Robert Perry. I was introduced as a walking Course in Miracles encyclopedia. It's that all you need to do is get introduced as an encyclopedia, and there's something inside you that goes, oh, I don't want to be an encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, nobody wants to be an encyclopedia. Not even a Course in Miracles encyclopedia, you know. Nobody has that as their goal in life. And so what I found is, the more I began to travel, most of the people that I met when I traveled around were, were not course students, they didn't know anything about the course, and they really weren't into metaphysics either. Most of them had their own philosophies and belief systems, or religions. And they really weren't interested in anything else, you know. This is what I believe, and that's me. And so, I found that um, I had to start to really relax, so that the Spirit could come through me in an involuntary way. Sometimes we may start off talking about the weather or what a beautiful day it was. It was, it wasn't trying to, you know, be metaphysically correct, like people try to be politically correct. It's, it's just as hazardous if you try to be metaphysically correct with your words. You can't say to somebody, oh, isn't it a beautiful day, if you, if you realize that God didn't create days. You know, imagine going up to somebody and go, yeah, this is totally imaginary and, and, and it, this, there is no such thing as a day, and there's no such thing as beautiful. You know, the conversation's not going to go anywhere. You probably just get a weird look, and a little bit of, and then, so I learned to relax, and I would have these beautiful conversations that would start off like a lot of typical 
conversations start. When you're on a plane or a train or a bus or you're in a grocery store or in a park or whatever, there's some kind of an initial greeting. It's a very loving, welcoming, friendly type of thing. It's non-threatening and it's very typical with the way humans communicate. The underneath, sometimes they do want to express a lot more, but they don't want to just jump right in to it. It has to kind of ease its way in there. And then as I would relax, the Spirit would come through me with whatever the Spirit would say. Sometimes their eyes would light up or, oh my gosh, I was just thinking of that or the Spirit knows how to direct the conversation. And that's the most important thing is you become so relaxed and so friendly. You're in that friendly, friendly vibe that the, the words just come through you and they just flow out like, like water flowing water. And the conversation goes in a very easy way. There's nothing forced. I've even been on plane flights where uh, you may fly and just have, say a few small things to each other for most of the flight and then just as the plane is descending, the spirit decides that's the time and you mention a book by an author or something and they go, oh my god, I, think, I love that author and then you have a really deep discussion while the plane is landing. You give a, a nice hug and then you're off and you never see the person again. You know, it, there's a flow to it, you know, of not trying to push anything, not trying to force anything, and just being in that friendliness, that general friendliness with, you can, with everyone around you really as you move through the day. You just, you just exude friendliness and then people come and, and reflect that. And sometimes you don't, you don't have to have deep metaphysical discussions. Um, a lot of my trips to countries, I don't even speak the language, I don't even know the language there, but, but a smile is a universal uh, symbol, laughter is universal. Uh, I find it's kind of fun for me to communicate with people where neither of us speak the same language and yet we can have a, a recognition and a gaze in our eyes and there's a friendliness and a lightness going on and you feel the blessing there even though we're, we're really not going to be going into much <laughs> of a conversation. We're, we're actually laughing at, at how, some of the words that we, I say something, they don't know what it means, they say something, I don't know what it means and yet we laugh and we feel connected, even though there's not a, a typical conversation going on. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? I was just wondering what, uh, which book you refer to or part of the Bible when you say, Jesus says, smile more frequently. Um, where, where do I find that? Or the forehead which should be serene. Where does Jesus say that? Well, I could give kind of the history of, I'll give you a little bit of history of, of the expressions of, of um, wisdom and revelatory uh, light on the planet. Most people are familiar with the Bible uh, because it's the Judeo-Christian world. Aside from, from Islam and parts of the world, the Judeo-Christian world is all based, the cultures and everything are, are embedded with the Bible. And then, um, I've heard that there's been like four revelatory kind of scriptures, and my list would probably be a lot bigger because I, I, Veda Vedanta, a lot of the Indian scriptures I would put right in there too, but, but the Bible, and then um, there was a book that was called um, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. It was actually by Mary Baker Eddy, and that was the second magnificent revelation of of God's love and truth um, on earth. And some people remember her as saying there's no mind in matter, there's no life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. She was really experiencing the divine mind and that's why she could heal the sick. Uh, you know, there was many healings that happened around her life. And then the third one that came across, some of you might have heard of, is called the Urantia Book. Um, and the last section of the Urantia book is the life and teachings of Jesus. And this book, I just cried uh, all the way through the last section of this because from the Bible we basically, we hear about Joseph and Mary 
and we hear about the stable and Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and we jump to, he's like 12 years old, and he's in the temple. Don't you know I have to be about my father's business when Joseph and Mary are a bit upset that uh, he's not with them. <laughs> he's back with the rabbis and the teachers. And then he jumps into his early 30s, and he says, I, follow me. He's calling apostles. He's calling his 12 apostles. And then we follow him through his public teaching and his miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, many, many miracles. And then we follow him through the crucifixion, and then we follow him through the resurrection, the whole story. And that's what we know, basically, of Jesus. I had one kind of a prayer to God, which was like, could I have a little more fuller picture of Jesus? I would really like to know if it was 35, 36 years, please give me the full 35. I'm grateful for what I got from the Bible. I'm grateful for those red words in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which I've, I've been raised Christian, so I've lit up from that. But I want to know more of a full picture. The Urantia book, this last section, gives you the full picture. And the book that I'm referring to now, when I say in his workbook, uh, you smile more frequently, your forehead is serene, that book is A Course in Miracles, which is the fourth of these great revelations on earth. This is a book that, that has come to us from Jesus, and most of the book is in first person. So, he is speaking I, I, I. It's basically Jesus giving us the mechanics and the practice of practicing the forgiveness that he taught 2,000 years ago. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Because Christians have been trying to forgive for the last 2,000 years. The Bible said forgive 70 times 7. Well, I've tried that. That's 490 times and it didn't work. You know, I, I, I must need more than 70 times 7. And so I'm interested in what, what that's going to be, you know, I'm interested in coming to live a Christ-inspired life. I, I'm interested in living to, as the way shower did, you know, the way, the truth, and the life led the way. I'm interested in finding out anything I can. So, A Course in Miracles is a book that was scribed, um, was written down from 1965 to 1972. It has a text, it has a workbook and it has a manual for teachers, and it changed my life forever. I, when I came across this book, my heart was like exploding with love. I felt like I got hit with a, a tsunami of, of love. I felt like, like I had received an answer to a prayer, and as soon as I dove into the Course and began pouring my heart and soul in it, I had this feeling wash over me like, oh, now I've got no excuses. Before I was always saying to God, can't you make it a little bit clearer? Can't you be more specific? Can't you be more helpful and be more specific in my life? And basically, the book was saying, the connection with the Holy Spirit and Jesus is the most important thing. That once you reestablish your connection with Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will direct you very specifically what to do, where to go, what to say. You know, it's not going to be a guesswork thing that you've been accustomed to. You're going to get very specific guidance that will clear the debris of judgment from your mind. It will clear the conflict of the human condition. It will, it will clear your mind, and will prepare you to know the Kingdom of Heaven within, which is what Jesus was clearly pointing to in the Bible, and the Scriptures. So, for me, that experience that I had with the wave of love coming over me, occurred in 1986, so that's 30 years ago. And then, after five years of immersing myself in the teachings of this book, then I was, I was sent on a teaching mission that has involved 40 some odd countries and gatherings like this, uh, where there's just an open welcome in many, many countries and many places, many of which I don't speak the language, so I've had many translators that have followed. And 
it's been a very intimate experience of opening to that presence and listening and following. There are other pathways to God, including prayer and meditation, and um, I think meditation is is very traditional pathway back to oneness, but it's also very time consuming. It, it can seem like the progress in meditation is so slow that most people find it very difficult to, to quiet their mind, or to even sit still for any period of time. And I would say that, that working with Jesus, it's been, there's been prayer, there's been meditation, stillness, but there's been a mostly listen and follow, like, okay Lord, I'm yours now and I will do whatever you tell me to do, because you know the way back to eternity, and I don't. So I will be the listener and you will be the, the guide. And so that's been the process, and that's the, that's the book. Um, it's available online for free, it's available in uh, like probably Kindle, you can get it in yep. audio book. I mean, it's, it's available in many different ways. And I particularly have enjoyed um, letting the Spirit and Jesus show me how to retranslate movies, metaphysical movies. Uh, some of you know The Matrix and Groundhog Day and so forth. Well, the Spirit started with me on these metaphysical movies. Um, many years ago, and so I've had so much fun with the Spirit and tuning into the Spirit that that now we have like a, almost like a, a movie pathway to God, where you can, instead of going to the temple, you watch movies, <laughs> and, and you get spiritual inspiration, like these are the modern day parables that are, that are guiding us home. And of course music, and there's been many different experiential things that have come, and so, yeah, for those of you that follow along, there's, there's been an enormous amount of resources and tools and materials that have come through from this joy. Because once you get into the joy, then it's like, thank you, that's very good, and what would you have me do now? And it's extend the joy. Make it understandable, put it in simple language that people can take in, that they can grasp put it in forms and symbols that, that people can find helpful, you know, that's not sailing over their heads. It's actually something that they can actually engage in. <coughs> so that's been my journey. I've, I'm having a party here. I've been having a, a party for the last quarter of a century. And I'm glad you've found your way into my party. <laughs> <laughs> it's very profound too. I take this as, when I talk about those books, I talk about People say the Bible, they, they'll use a synonym and they'll call it scripture. And I feel like scripture is very important, extremely important. So the Bible was extremely important to me, so was Mary Baker Eddy's book, so was the life and teachings of Jesus and Rancha, and so has been the Course of Miracles. It's been like an extension of scripture that has brought me into a, a peaceful state of mind that doesn't waver. I do tell groups as I travel around that that people say, what about the ego? And I say, well, I, I haven't had a bad day in so many years that I've actually forgotten my last bad day. It's, so, it's literally, I've got amnesia going on around this bad day now. Because the joy becomes consistent, it becomes stable. It, you, you feel it's your life, it's your very identity. It's, it's everything. There's nothing more important than the peace of God. Okay, anyone else? Yes. If, if you might just add, to finish what you said, um, I've been practicing uh, Christian meditation for 13 years, twice a day. It's not easy, I must say, but it has been a healing process for me. I had cancer, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I had cancer six times. And I think if I had gone through all the, uh, the trauma and the difficulties, it was largely due to the good doctors but also to the meditative process. So I'm all for saying that meditation uh, is really something spiritually to consider as well, even though it's hard to do, to do daily. But for me, I can witness to the huge uh, influence in my life. And, um, well. Thank you. Thank you.
It's the old testimony for that. Yes. I mean, David, I just wanted to ask, when you're receiving the guidance from Jesus, um, more so at the beginning, was there any doubt at all that this could be the wrong mind rather than the right mind uh, speaking to me? Or you just knew 100% this is coming from the Spirit? Well, at the very, very, very beginning, um, I was not cleared enough to, to hear this voice. It's not like an audible voice, but it's like this stream of thought. And so, like so many, I, I kept praying. I was very devoted and sincere in my prayers, but I would get signs and symbols. It's like Jesus would use, you know, different scriptures or bumper stickers, billboards. My mother speaking to me, and, and I'd be like, oh God, that's good. <laughs> I just remember that. You know, it, it came in a lot of ways, but it didn't, it didn't feel like it was like a, a, a guidance that was totally within me. I was just getting it through lots of signs and symbols. And then, after I studied the Course for about eight hours a day for about two and a half years, then, then suddenly it was just like this presence just came over me, and, and I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was being guided by Jesus, where to go, what to do. It was very specific. It wasn't, I will love you always, I will love you even until the end of time, the stuff from the Bible. This was like, you forgot your keys, you know. And it's very practical, you know, extremely practical. So that was like a first phase, and then Jesus said, I want to speak through you, which was, I was very shy, so that was kind of frightening as well. You know, because parents said never speak about God or politics in public, and you know, and you're going out and, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have the confidence, you know, I wasn't aligned with Christ so much that I, I was like talking about, you know, speaking purely for my amnesty. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, <laughs> course in miracles, you know, I, no, it, it was none of, <laughs> none of that. It was really like learning to immerse and let that come through more and more. But, but because my, my state of mind radically shifted from years of shyness, embarrassment, um, some sadness, depression, insecurities, worries, anxieties, into this booming, flowing confidence in which you all say down here, no worries mate. You know, when you go from that into no worries mate state of mind, you're like, something's different. Something's majorly different. When you can mean no worries mate, really from your heart, you're in that, that carefree state of mind, then you know, ooh, something major has happened here. And that, from that point on, no, I, I have never doubted, I, I have been able to discern when the ego is shrieking and, and trying to convince me otherwise. I, I, the ego speaks first, so it would, you know, it would give me an earful, and then, then the spirit waits, and then this gentle, you know, it is not so, I love you my beloved, and it would just be so clear, and so it was so crystal clear, there never has been a doubt. In fact, it was so clear that that suddenly I had people coming in the 1990s just saying, I, I have found you, you are my teacher, I am your student. And I thought, oh, that's what's in the manual for teachers. <coughs> and also I remembered from my Indian literature that that happens. Yes. You know, there comes a point where people start showing up and claiming that they're students, and you shouldn't push it away, you should go, oh, this is my opportunity to deepen in the presence. The students are bringing a gift. Every student brings a gift of an opportunity to deepen in presence. So, there was one of my students at one point who looked me in the eye and she said, what if the Course is like the biggest hoax that ever was? And, and I just looked her in the eye and I said, you really think that? And she said, surely you must have had that thought at least once. Uh, just at least once, David. And I said, oh no, I, no I've never the experience has been so strong from the very first giant wave of love, and I have never had a, a doubt thought about the Course, or about Jesus, or about the Presence. In fact, it's been those times when I was doing the Course, like Lesson 136, Sickness is a Defense Against the Truth, where I seem to have flu symptoms and diarrhea or whatever, 
that I went down deep enough into my mind to a point in my mind that I thought either Jesus, everything Jesus told me in the Bible and the Course is true, or Jesus is the biggest liar of all time. And I had such a love for Jesus that I went right smack into that love and the symptoms just were gone in an instant. I had an instantaneous healing. It wasn't even a matter of, a, of two seconds, it just happened instantly. When I was clear of my love and, and, and where the, the source was coming from, there was no way that sickness could, could even seem to exist. It just vanished instantly. Like Jesus, when they would touch the hem of his garden garment, or when he would go around, you know, it was, it, the truth was so strong that error and illusions had no power. And that's what I experienced. So, no, actually, uh, in 30 years since the Course came into my life, no, I've not, I've never had one doubt thought about the Course or Jesus. Now, as far as my identity, that's been a purification of, of First, letting the Holy Spirit, Jesus, work through me, and then opening to emerge, to start to feel at one with the Christ. That that's natural, to feel that much love, that much glory, that much strength. And so it's been a trust, it's been a walk of trust. And it's just grown stronger and stronger and stronger, uh, to the point, you know, where it's like, I don't, I don't have these, in, I don't have an internal battle going on anymore. The light has won, and therefore the struggle is over. And in Course in Miracles terms, that's a happy dream. It's when we don't judge the dream anymore. We don't judge it positively or negatively. We just behold it, we appreciate it, we have gratitude for everything that's happening. There's still things that seem to go on with the body, with the world, and so forth. Uh, just coming from Mudgee, um, I was up in Mudgee and um, I was having a very crunchy piece of toast and I felt like something snap in my mouth and, and it took me about a day to finally stick my finger back and realize that I had a cracked tooth. And I was like, oh. So, I'm just getting ready to hop on the plane to come down here, and I have a cracked tooth, and I thought, and I've got all kinds of flights coming up, like days of flights back over to the United States, back over to North America, and so, so, um, yeah, and I called, I think I, I called Mel, and the Skype, no answer, then you called me back, and then Mel ends up Googling Good Friday, <laughs> Emergency, Emergency Dental Sydney. <laughs> Sydney. And amazingly, that really worked out. I had a fun encounter with, on Good Friday, with a Muslim um, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> on Good Friday. That's so all inclusive, you see. Jesus, he does it. He's an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> he brings in a Good Friday. Everyone's, everything's shut down here in Sydney. Everyone's in Good Friday. And he's, I'll get a Muslim from you. I don't care about the Good Friday stuff, you know. We'll go, we'll go outside to another religion, you know. But it, it was a wonderful encounter, and yeah, he put a he put a band, a metal band, around the tooth, and and got me patched up for my long days of flights until whatever's next. But see, to me, that's just I had a delightful time with him, and to me, that's just another way to meet yourself, to meet a brother, to meet a sister. Everything gets handled, and you go along, shining your light and expressing your love, and we had a wonderful time together. It was fun. We can even hear you all laughing out in the, uh, the waiting room. Mm -hmm. While we were in there, he was doing the procedure, and I heard his bellows of laughter from everyone out in the, the waiting room. Which I'm sure he just opened up for us, he probably just came in, he was probably at home, and, but yeah, it was beautiful. So. You can continue on in your joy and happiness, and then whatever needs to be taken care of with the body or whatever, you just see that that's part of it. And I've had that happen many times on many travels, because I'm so focused on my purpose and my sharing and, and teaching that um, things have just, they just kind of come.
come in, they're orchestrated in all kinds of different ways, depending on what country or whatever I'm in. So it's good to know. It's you know, you can actually listen to the voice for God all day without interrupting your regular activities in any way. You don't have to be off in a closet chanting or you know doing. Isn't it wonderful to know that you can flow through what seems to be your life experiences? Uh, Frank Barker, I watched you on Facebook. I guess you see out there in the farm with the animals and your family growing up. And see, even though I haven't been here in five years, we've got Facebook. <laughs> and you stroll right in here from Kangaroo Valley. It's so beautiful that, that the love, the connection's there and you see the symbols. And it's like, you know, it's as if you're there, you know, living with somebody, being with them and, you know, I think Facebook only allows me 5,000 friends, but I have, <laughs> yes. if I could pull it off, I'd have like 500,000. Uh, but it works. It all works. Mm. Frank. Um, beautiful person in the corner was asking about um, giving, and you were saying um, how it would be so helpful to just uh, be in the giving mode rather than a taking mode. Um, so I guess um, I'd like you to, I'm sort of setting you up, <laughs> if you like, in the sense of helping others. Um, my great experience is that most of the time I'm in resistance. Um, Freud's great discovery um, that, uh, that a lot of the time we don't want to give or we don't want to join. Um, we have so many grievances or um, hesitations blocks and of course the wonderful course you know, in the very introduction tells us that it's not here to teach the meaning of love but it's here to help us remove the blocks of the awareness of love's eternal presence and um, so I guess my question in a way of a setup for our friend um, is to where you 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 know so obviously in, in spirit but then many of us really may not be ready for that that devotion or that that decision to say, okay, I'll jump. So many of us would, you know, where you suggest to somebody, you know, be giving, and of course there's you know, a hint maybe where we will translate it in our mind to a should. So we then go off in guilt, saying, well, I should be giving, but damn it, you know, for its sake I can't. <laughs> so. I'd like you to maybe just share with you your experience of dealing with the resistance, you know, these blocks to the awareness of love's presence, to where, how, if we're in that mode that says, no, I'm not ready, or I can't, or I don't want to, or I'm afraid to, you know, that's what it's really about, that we're afraid of God, God's love. Um, in your experience, maybe before that, that massive place where you came to decide that I'm ready, what was your experience with dealing with the resistance and how did spirit help you um, to do that? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. I think one part of the course that, that kind of, I'll use this as a, like a precursor, is that when Jesus says, trust would settle every problem now. And I, I could really see um, when I first opened the course, I actually opened to the Manual for Teachers first out of the whole course. And I opened to those stages of the development of trust and, and those ten characteristics of a teacher of God. That's what caught my attention first. Starting off with trust and then honesty and, and rolling on. And, and those stages, in other words, it had helped me to see those stages like trust is something that's going to take time to develop. There's, you know, there are a few people, we could say throughout history, that actually have such a deep, impactful, significant, revelatory experience, like Eckhart Tolle had on the park bench in England. And those do come along, and so we can't dismiss them, but they're so rare. Um, most people are given a much more slowly evolving uh, curriculum that's washing away that enormous fear and resistance. Almost like it's a stagnation. The fear is set in so thick that the mind is like infected with fear and guilt. And trust seems like this little flicker of light, a little spark 
that's there, we're aware of it, but it seems very distant. It doesn't seem like it's something we can call upon on a daily basis. You know, it's a flicker. So, for me, I think, um, what, what was it that helped wash away the resistance, is really your question. What did you do to face the resistance? Um, I, I studied the Course because I could see that it was three books and it was over 1200 pages in the English version, and so I thought, well there's clearly some study involved in this. And so I didn't want to skip over that and just try to get it through osmosis or put it under my pillow. You know, and just say, transmit as I dream tonight. Transmit all of your light, you know. I didn't even try that. I didn't even try sticking it under the pillow or, you know, touching it or doing anything. I just felt like, no, this is a, it's a big book because it's meant to be studied carefully. But then I had resistance initially to how much time can I give to this. When there's so many practical concerns, most human beings have a whole array of practicality they've wound themselves into quite a lot. It can be debt, it can be duties, responsibilities, very thick, like a thick veil of, of uh, shoulds and ought tos. Just a, sleep. Yeah, yeah. Eat, sleep, work, and should, and ought to, and better get to this, I'll have to do it tomorrow. I mean, I just couldn't fit it into the day. That's pretty typical for most human beings. And so, I actually, I did give myself some what I call hermitage experiences where, in modern terms, it might be to give yourself like a, a retreat occasionally, to go off, either by yourself or go to a Vipassana retreat or to a Buddhist center, or a monastery, a convent or something. I, I get started giving myself retreats and I, I sensed uh, that there was a great benefit to the meditation and stillness so that I, I wanted to give myself more and more, as much as I could. But this voice was pretty strong in my mind. What about your student loans? What about, you know, it was, what about all the practicalities? And you can't ignore the practicalities. The Spirit's not just going to beam you up, uh, you know, beam me up, Scotty, you know, just to get this thing over with right away. You, if you've wound yourself in with the ego tightly into things, the Spirit will unwind you very carefully and very graciously with great gentleness out of whatever was wound into. So those early years, um, there was a lot of miracles. I would pray like, instead of like David hunting for jobs to pay off uh, loans, student loans, I actually decided to ask for help and guidance. Like, show me the job that would be most helpful to me and to the whole universe. Instead of me trying to figure it out from my past learning. I just started to Trust, because there is decisions to be made around money and debts and all kinds of things, and around relationships and, and that. And then, um, after a while, when, this, when the debts got paid off, and I even had a little money to, to buy a little trailer, I bought a little hermitage, a little trailer in the woods in, in Kentucky, and I would go down there periodically for, with the course to study, pray, meditate, um, I started to have lots of holy encounters with people, and I started to trust that, like there was a farmer down there who was very friendly, and he, he was always giving me stuff that he had grown, and I started to have to allow that things could come to me in ways that I wasn't used to. Because I was Protestant work ethic, and you only, you work for things, you don't take handouts, and you know, I had the whole thing. I had to start realizing that my prayer time, my meditation time, and my study with the Course was actually important. And that Jesus could provide for me in ways that David couldn't even conceive of. And so that was a key to start to loosen from the resistance. Like, to allow the Spirit to reach me with the dream symbols in a way that I could see it was a gift from Jesus. And I, I resisted, I was so stubborn. I turned so many people down at the beginning. Oh no, thank you. No, I couldn't. Oh no, I was at my modesty. Oh my, no, I couldn't. I can't. No, no. And then Jesus is finally like, would you stop that? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to do something important for me. I'm providing for you and you're turning down the offers. And he said, it's me. I'm, I'm behind that farmer. I'm behind that, that, that 
jar of jam that you're, you're getting. That was me, you know. I'm helping you and you're fighting it with your pride. So there's a lot of, of washing away of pride. I think the biggest thing that helped with the resistance though is when like three different times I just got so relaxed in my mind that I went into revelatory experiences where the world disappeared. I went into, I went through the disappearance of the universe and I went directly into the great rays. And in the great rays, they're so convincing. Um, no matter what history I had built up over who knows how many lifetimes and whatever in the cosmos, the great rays were like an unspeakable experience and they were, they were so confidence building that when I would come back from the revelation, I always felt like I had been picked up and carried somehow like thousands of years ahead. Even though I was back in the same environment, my mind felt expanded and more confident and less resistant every time. So the revelatory experiences were those mystical experiences were, were, I can't even begin to estimate how, how valuable they were. And then, after the revelatory experiences, I was guided to hit the road. Well, that was a, a definite experiment. Um, from 1991 to 1996, to not have a house, uh, to not have a place to call my own. I didn't even have a tent. Uh, I just thought, Jesus was like saying, no, I'm, you trust me, I'm going to go before you. And I'm like, but this is earth. This is earth you don't know. You, you need motel rooms and you've, you've got to have food and you, you, that's why we have jobs down here and that's why we have mortgages. You know, it's, it's like, I really was giving it to him and he was like, I've been there. <laughs> I've, I've been there. You're like, you're not telling me anything new. I've been there. I was like, you should see how it was 2,000 years ago with people <laughs> hanging people upside down on crosses to bleed upside down to death. You know, it's like, you know, he's been there. He's, I've been through that. You know, it's like, you're not telling me anything new. And yet it was like, do you trust me? He was like, he was saying, I, I'm calling you and you have answered. Now, do you trust me? So this is where the, the convincing goes on, because back and forth with Jesus, you know, it's like, I'm saying money doesn't grow on trees, I can't just go back and harvest hundred dollar bills and fifty dollar bills and twenty dollar bills off the tree. Me being as practical as I could, and him coming back with, yes, you, I know that's what you believe. It's always what you believe. Like, he was just saying, you're limited by your beliefs and your thoughts. Anything's possible. You know, with, if God is with us, who can be against us? Anything's possible. All that stuff in the Bible was just, he was coming back with. And so, those years of traveling from like 1991 to 1996 without a home and whatever, if somebody told me, you're going to take, take off walking like a sannyasi, and we do, thankfully we have India here, because we can read about these characters that have been doing it for centuries, <laughs> even though maybe not in Australia. We have the Aboriginals over here, and every place has their own witnesses. You know, the Aboriginals, they did walkabout. The sannyasis were basically doing walkabout right. in India. So I, I, I'm glad I got to read about the sannyasis, because if Jesus had said, just go out and start walking, and I'd say, what? Is this a suicide mission? You know, <laughs> just like, walk the streets of Sydney, walk the streets of, of New York City or whatever, I'd be like, you got to be kidding me. But actually, I, I did have some witnesses. I was reading Eastern books and I had read enough to know that, that this was not an actually unusual request. Uh, there was a context for it. I wasn't like the first person. I knew Peace Pilgrim in the United States and different sannyasis. So I was quite amazed at those five years because I didn't know day by day where I would be sleeping, I didn't know where the food would be coming from, I didn't have like CDs and money market and, and I didn't have a portfolio of sitting in the bank, so it would have been scary enough to even have a portfolio and not know what you're doing from day to day, that would be nerve-wracking enough, but then without the portfolio, then it was like a double, like 
oh, and who's going to pay for that? You know, where, where, where am I going to sleep? And Jesus just said, trust me, trust me. So those first days in 1991 when I went out and I had enough money to get a little three-cylinder car and scoot off and I went on a, like a five and a half week trip. That was an amazing five and a half week trip because at no point during those five and a half weeks did I ever hit a big snag. It's like every day things were provided. And that's, that was very convincing. Even that first five and a half weeks, it just, it overthrew all my conditioning. Twenty, almost thirty years of conditioning on planet Earth, and those five and a half weeks were like, man, it was like a fairy tale, or like a magic carpet ride. It felt like I was in Aladdin or in some kind of movie where people were, hey, come here, hey, come here, sleep on my boat, sleep here, you need some food, you need this, you need that. It just was, it was like a fairy tale. I'm sure the sannyasis had the same experiences. Yes. I've, I've loved reading their lives, how they just took off walking. Sometimes the teenager leave their Indian families, families and yeah. go walking, and amazing experiences, and end up these the mystics that, that just were, spectacular. That's kind of what was happening for me was, even though it was a different context than India, because sometimes sannyasis are actually respected and there are people that build an extra room on their house for the traveling sannyasis. Not in America. <laughs> no. It's a den, it's a TV rec room to watch the big football game. We're not having any sannyasis over today. <laughs> What are those sannyasis? I don't like the sound of the sannyasis. You bring me my neighbor, we'll root for them the Super Bowl. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to... Well, those are just vagrants out there. We're homeless. We're not inviting any homeless in. We're going to use it for a rec room, you know, or something like this. You know, it's a different mentality over here. Although, in Australia, you know, Marla Morgan, mutant message down under. You guys have it. You've got your own sannyasis. <laughs> The aboriginals, you know, you can't say you haven't had the witnesses here, because you have. They're very telepathic, very trusting, amazing. Now there's your aboriginals, there's your advanced civilization. <laughs> Everybody say, oh the white, when they came over, took over, no, no. The advanced civilization was still here, is still here, and we could choose to listen to them and learn from them or not, or think that we're superior, you know, when actually it's pretty strong. So those five years were very convincing. Those five years I think did more uh, in terms of working with the Course and Jesus than anything else because I started to get this feeling, more of like a quantum feeling, like everything in my day was completely arranged for me. That I wasn't going against the world or against society or things weren't happening to me. Everything was happening for me. If I needed a place to stay, something happened for me, so I had a place to stay. Something to eat for me. Someone to talk to for me. For me, for me, for me. You see how that turns the mentality around of what am I going to get from this? And, and even the world has the formula where if you become a good getter, if you become a successful getter, and an affluent getter, then you can retire. You build a giant nest egg, giant savings, and you become such a good getter that you, I got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow, got the string around my finger. What a world, what a life. I've got investments, I've got CDs, money market, ooh, I've got gold bars, precious metals, I've got a portfolio that's so, got the world on a string. That's the ego trying to convince you that if you become such a good getter, and such a good possessor, and such a good accumulator, that somehow then you'll be able to enjoy some lives of, with your nest egg on the world and then die. <laughs> you know, and that was actually in the Bible. Eat, drink, and be merry, for one day we shall die. It's very <laughs> pessimistic. If that's your philosophy of life, you might listen to Jesus tell you, you don't ask for too much in life, you ask for far too little. If you're planning to just eat, get, while the getting's good, get plenty, 
build up a big nest egg, big savings, enjoy a few years, hopefully, of retirement. As your teeth fall out and your body sags and you cancer and heart disease and all these other things. But if you happen to avoid all that, maybe, <laughs> then you have a few years to enjoy and then you're dead. And that, I just, at some point in my life, I said, that's not good enough. That, I'm, I'm worth more than that. And I'm willing to go on this whole new journey of throw caution to the wind and trust the Spirit to provide. And I'm, I would rather put my eggs in that basket. I would rather put my eggs in trusting the Divine than from trying to follow the well-beaten down, worn path ways of the world. Because nobody's really so happy with that. You know, nobody's exceedingly happy. The sannyasis were happy, to me. They were very happy, but they weren't into any of that stuff. All I need is the air that I breathe and to love you. Don't you love those songs? We're all one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the spirit. The spirit says you don't even need air, ultimately, you know. <laughs> Imagine that. You're finally there. You're taking your last breath on planet Earth, the last gasp of air, and you're thinking, ah, well done. And goodbye. <laughs> Going back home to heaven. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't you rather have breathe your last breath with a welcoming of the light of heaven than of God? Who knows what comes next after this roller coaster? <laughs> you know. So those those convinced me. And then at the tail end of those five years, I was guided um, to this little house that I ended up, through donations, I was able eventually to, to purchase it, uh, called the Peace House, which is still in Cincinnati, Ohio. And this, this was a four-bedroom house that I got for $40,000. And um, the Spirit dropped that one in, even after the sannyasi period, because I thought, I, well that was fun, but what's next? <laughs> and the, the Peace House came in as base to do like a worldwide internet ministry and to launch out of onto trips like Australia, you know, South Africa, China, all the different, six different continents. That was a, like a little launching pad to kind of go out and then have, that was my cave. Instead of coming back into the cave, regular cave, that was like a little cave where I would launch from and go out. And it all worked. And yeah, I still have that house and still use that house as kind of a launch pad. So that's, that's the short answer to it. That we, you know, we have to build the trust in some way, and it's not like trust is something on a scale of small to big. We all have a very powerful mind, so we all have faith, we all have trust. It's more of what are we trusting in? Are we trusting into the ego and the ways of the world for our safety, security, happiness, peace? Or are we trusting in our intuitive guidance? Because we have a powerful mind and we're going to invest it in something. And when we aim it at the ego, it just seems like we have a, it's a stressful life. <coughs> and when we aim it at the spirit, it just gets less and less stressful and more flowing. Like things are just showing up, things are being provided. It seems more magical. Uh, yesterday when we were coming, Dennis picked us up and we were coming back from the airport and we're driving and Mel's like, look, look ahead of us, that car, that's Paul. And we saw Paul, and Paul pulled over, and we pulled over, and we all got out of the car, and we went, oh, look at this, out of all of Sydney, we're just driving from the airport, and we see Paul. Out of all the millions of people and cars, we just, and we just hugged on the sidewalk, and then what was the name of the sign that was behind us? In sync. Living in sync. Living in sync. Yeah. Yeah. Big letters, yeah. right where we're hugging on the sidewalk. We were, we were like, yeah, that's living in sync. So the Spirit is like giving commentary, you know, it's like cosmic humor. Like, that's right, that's what I want you to do, living in sync. You know, synchronicity. Don't we like synchronicities when everything flows so happy and easy and we go, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. And wouldn't it be nice if our whole life was one big series of synchronicities? And, and our life can be a series of synchronicities. What's stopping us? Only our fear and doubt. Only our, our doubting mentality. Yeah. 
should be getting close to our. Yeah, I was say, we're right. about. We've got time for one more question or comment or miracle because then we're we're at our tea break. That's what we do in Australia. We have tea breaks. <laughs> Can I just ask a question in the sense that, uh, continuing on from what you were just saying earlier about trusting and following spirit and what have you, um, this has just been a nagging thought in my mind and I really would like to clear it. Um, If it wasn't for the people who were in the world earning money and what people such as yourself wouldn't have a place to sleep, wouldn't be given food. Uh, So are you saying then that... um, There's a a process, there's um, people who have accumulated in life, um, have the wherewithal to provide accommodation and and all that sort of thing and and have a beautiful house like this for you to come and speak to us. That's all part of of everything. Yeah, it's a a good question because, because there's a part of the mind that can think, well, unless you have things that are established and working, then there would be no way to be provided for. Uh, because, you know, people have said that, people have listened to me speak for a number of hours and they'd say, well, but what about those mechanics and those builders that built the planes that you fly in, that, that, that do all the things, you know, there's a lot of work. There is a movie in my movie collection that starts to show more an accurate picture of things that, that we actually think buildings are built by carpenters, bricklayers, architects, designers. We actually think that Hollywood movies and Bollywood movies are are made by filmmakers and cameramen and cinematographers and actors and actresses. We tend to think on the linear plane as if there's causes and things that are actually needed, they're practical in the world. When actually the entire built environment and the natural environment, the mountains, the the seas, the rivers, the stars, the black holes, and everything we would call the built environment of cities and everything is all part of a giant projection. So in other words, there's really no real characters and real things going on. It's, it's, a, it's a screen of images that the Holy Spirit can use in, as symbols, while you still believe you're human, to reach the mind which still seems to have needs and things, practicalities, to convince the mind that it's that none of it's real. So in other words, the spirit is orchestrating everything. For example, um, you know, if we go back to Jesus, even the story of Jesus, you know, everybody knows the story of his public ministry for three years and then he was crucified and then he rose again. And he he appeared to the apostles. Uh, he, you know, that's kind of an out of pattern thing. It's the first one I think in history that now we've got a dead man, dead man walking. <laughs> uh, he's back. He's he's back. And the Ur- the Rancher book gives us a, a clear picture of that. That basically it says the angels made a body for him, and he did make 23 appearances, and it didn't have a heart pumping blood. It wasn't an apparition, kind of like a ghost that you can put your hand through. It, it looked, it felt like a real body, but it was, a, it was a composite, a synthetic model that was just used for him to speak when he seemed to return. Similarly, when we travel, I start to see that, like, if we looked at the Aborigines, for example, when they're on their walkabout, they're not relying on um, homes like this, for their uh, travels or teachings, they, they're they relying on their guidance and their telepathy for, for an animal that's chosen to give itself up, you know, for them to eat. They're so aware of things that it's not like going out even to kill the animal. The animal is choosing to provide itself for them. You know, if we go deeper into it, you start to realize that if you go for it, that all the symbols will be arranged in a way that will help the awakening of the mind. And I think in my life, the parable of David, probably one of the most extreme examples of that, actually happened here in Australia. 
I've told this parable over and over and people will listen to it and they'll say, surely, surely you're not saying what I think you're saying on the tape. But I'm saying what I'm saying on the tape. <laughs> I came down to Australia and it was Captain Les. It was this captain in Qantas Airlines and he came to Noosa, spent a week with me and everything, but I think I think even when he came to spend like a week with me, he had to get off of Qantas Airlines and they would say, is your daughter getting married, did somebody die in the family and everything. It's not one of the things you can tell Qantas, I'm going to hear a mystic speak, you know, I need a week off. Uh, did somebody die? No, nobody's died. This is about everlasting life, you know, it just doesn't work. But anyway, he, he actually got a doctor's note, he went into a doctor and and said, I have to come to this retreat and I, I need a note from you to give to my employers. And they, they gave it to him. Then when I came back, I was coming down here to Sydney and everything and, and him and his wife, his wife was wondering how he was going to pull like 23 days off of work from Qantas um, because he didn't have 23 days off of work and all he could say is, I've given it to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Frank remembers Liz. I've given it to the Holy Spirit confidently. She's like, listen, there's no way you are, you, you've got a doctor's excuse to get out of a week, but you're not getting off from, from a major employer for, that, for 23 days or whatever because you need to go spend time with David. Uh, it's just not going to work. I've given it to the Holy Spirit. In the end, he confidently waited until I was coming over, and right before I was coming over, and he wanted to spend all his time with me, uh, something happened that allowed him to get 23 days off with me. A strike. An industrial pilot strike. It was a pilot strike. The whole globe yeah. went into global recession. <laughs> the entire globe <laughs> took a nosedive. I mean a major nose that panic, the whole globe went into global recession so that he could spend 23 days with me. <laughs> Not two, nothing major. Because his wife kept saying, there's no way, there's no way. He's, I, the Holy Spirit is arranging this. Now in the Course of Miracles, Jesus actually says, if you will be a miracle worker for me, if you will do miracles for me, Jesus says, I will arrange time and space for you. Woo! Getting a little bit fairy taleish there, arranging time and space. Our parents never told us that there was any characters that could. Not even Jesus, they didn't say, eat your food, eat your dessert, follow Jesus, because he'll arrange time and space for you. What about your career? Don't worry about a career. What about your education? Don't worry about your education. Education means nothing. Career means nothing. What about the candy? Eat all the candy you want, it's all right, it doesn't matter. Just <laughs> follow Jesus and he'll arrange time and space for us. Imagine if we were little children and we were told that at the dinner table every time. Don't worry about the future. Jesus will arrange time and space for you. Actually, that's actually what's happening. That when you give yourself over to it, the, the characters you meet, the things that you experience and everything are all part of an arrangement. When you do those workbook lessons, if you give yourself over to those workbook lessons and you truly believe Jesus will literally arrange all of your day and all of time and space just for one reason that you will experience what he's talking about in the workbook lesson. Now some of you have studied science and everybody knows Newtonian science, it's all very linear, you know, and we, it's empirical, you, you study the world, that's the scientific method, you study the world, you run it through vigorous <coughs> double-blind experiments and all kinds of things to make sure that you, you don't influence it, but you basically, it's an empirical model that we, we learn about the world by studying the world. It's a projection. It's coming from the mind. And it's entirely subjective that no two people of the seven billion actually see the same world. Every person is seeing a different world. There's seven bil billion different versions. We leave the animals out of it, just for now. Get into this, you're getting into trillions when you bring the animals and the ants and the bugs in there too. But you could bring those in too. There's trillions of different versions. Even every mosquito has a different <laughs> view 
the world than the humans even. It's trillions of versions and it's just showing that, that it's Maya because there are trillions of versions of reality. It's, it's all one. We're all unified. It's all unified consciousness and energy. So, as we give ourselves over, quantum physics now is, is discovering that, that the entire world that you perceive is subjective. It's not apart from your consciousness. Paul Davies, Australian quantum physicist from years ago, said there is no world. He said the same thing that Jesus says in the Course. There's no outside world. There's no world apart from your mind. And that everything that you perceive is coming from consciousness. And there's nothing apart from that consciousness. It's all a unified consciousness. But the ego makes it seem like there's billions of different angles. And it's those angles that are the problem. That they don't have any reality. So, in answer to your question, when you give yourself over to this, you can count on it being fairy taleish. you can count on things just showing up as if by magic, you can count on being provided for things like the Aboriginals did, and you don't even need a society to do this. You know, it's almost like, it's not society's there all along and you're kind of dealing with it. But the more you go into this, the more you see that the symbols are provided in amazing, miraculous ways. And you don't need to think that there are these external ones that are essential, that are doing their part, that are outside of you. Uh, a friend of mine came to me one time, and I was in Hermitage in the woods, and, and uh, we always loved movies. And he said, uh, I'm thinking of doing this uh, book of all these great movies and everything, and, and <coughs> becoming a filmmaker to help inspire and bless people in the world. And I said, well you did it. If you can think of it, it's already been done. Quantum, in a quantum way, anything you can think of has already been done. So it's not so much trying to figure it out from a people perspective, because those people are actually thoughts that are representing your thoughts. And you don't really need the people. You need the presence in your mind that shows you beyond the veil of the people. That shows you the, the unification, that shows you the, the joined singular mind. That's, that's what is really needed. And until you reach that point, it will seem as if you're flowing along effortlessly where things are, are part of your fairy tale. You need something, it's there. You, it comes again. It comes, the Holy Spirit will give you whatever you seem to need for as long as you needed it, but the Holy Spirit would not have you linger in time. So we never get caught on the manifesting, on the, the idea that we can find, solve the equation on earth. Because it's, it goes way beyond earth. I used to have these thoughts sometimes when I would go to, to movies, a matinee, and then I'd be watching a movie and the ego would say, there's all those people working, hard working people out there, and you're at this movie in the middle of the afternoon. And Jesus would say, no. I'm taking you to the movies for the benefit of everyone. That you may call them out of the world and into the stillness of the kingdom of heaven. So you see the contrast of those two voices. As if you're getting away with something, and then he, Jesus says, oh no, this is important, very important. Okay, I think we have hot cross, what do they call them, hot cross buns and cookies and tea and coffee, and coffee juice. juice, all kinds of things. And when will we resume? Let's try for 20 minutes. And how we go. 20 minutes, okay, <laughs> around, uh, around 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock, yeah. We'll be back. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah.